So, uh, of course, last Sunday, we had a, a great uh, service uh, on the park, amen? amen? And so it's uh, good to be back outside of the rain, amen? amen. And outside. <laughs> but, I mean, I felt like last Sunday was awesome. It was yeah. like perfect weather, great way for our first uh, outdoor service, amen? Amen. And uh, forward to many more. Yeah. But two weeks ago, uh, last time we were here, I, I preached a, a lesson on the cost of discipleship, amen? amen? Amen. And we studied out Luke chapter 14, right? Verse 25 to 33. And, and we just saw how it's going to cost us everything to become yeah. disciples, yeah. but then to help others become disciples as well as we try to fulfill Jesus' great commission in Matthew 28 to make disciples of all nations, amen? Yeah. Right. Now, what's awesome is that that's the vision that, uh, and really the the mission that Jesus gave his disciples, right, in Matthew 28. But for us, of course, if we want to be his disciples, we get that same mission as well, amen? Yep. amen. But what's cool is that in Mark chapter 1, we get to see when he first called his disciples, Jesus, right. to follow him, amen? Mm -hmm. and, and the purpose that he gives them for their life. And their incredible willingness to go after it is amazing. And so in Mark chapter 1, in verse 16, it says, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he got a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hard man and followed him. Whoa, come on. And I think this is incredible because you see the boldness of Jesus mm -hmm. to call these guys and say, give up your careers mm -hmm. and follow me. Mm -hmm. But then they did it. And they were willing to give up their careers. In fact, some of these guys left their family, amen, the family business right there, to follow this guy named Jesus. Yep. Yeah. Why? Because he says, if you follow me, I'm going to give you a new purpose in life. Yeah. Amen. Come on, bro. To be a fisher of men. Of course, they were fishermen, so they fished for fish. Yeah. But now, they went to fish for men and help them to follow Jesus as well. And, you know, fishing is awesome. I've actually don't have a lot of experience fishing. Come on. Uh, my first time fishing was this past year, around my, actually for, I think it was on my birthday, wow. when I was down in Florida, amen, and I was over at Matt Sullivan's house, I'm like, bro, teach me to fish, amen, and Matt <laughs> loves to fish, oh, yeah. and so he taught me how to cast and this, and, and I actually got, caught a fish at one point, finally, after an hour of being in the rain, amen, and it was kind of <laughs> cold, you know, it was like in the 60s, and I'm just like, well, really did it, but then, it, you know, I lost it, I'm like, Aww. hey, man, and I'm like, I was actually already late to where I had to be. I'm like, but why did I catch a fish that I didn't get to? And I was like, man, I was out there for like two hours. Like, I didn't catch one fish. What the heck? <laughs> of course, that Sunday, the children were fishing. Uh -huh. And my son caught five fish. And I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> and he's like there. I would send you this picture. And he got this fish. I'm like, you gave him that fish. He's like, no, nah, he caught it. I'm like, okay, you caught one fish. I'm like, you know what happened? I caught five fish. I'm like, all right, rub it in there. <laughs> so I don't know. I need to have Noel teach me to fish or something. Yeah. yeah. Come on. But these guys out there are like, hey, you're not just going to fish for fish, but you're going to go out and catch people Amen. to follow me, to follow Jesus. Mm. And he gave them. This is the beginning of this mission. Yeah. Of course, at the end of his life, he gives them the great commission in Matthew 28 <laughs> to go and make disciples. Of all nations. And so I believe that this summer we need to go on a mission, amen? Amen. Yeah. amen. To really fulfill Jesus' mission of making disciples of all nations. And so the title of the lesson is A Summer Mission. Ooh. And so what we're going to do this morning, let's go to Luke chapter 9. We're going to look at Luke, amen? And Luke chapter 9, throw another, it's a stretch? I tried. My jokes aren't that funny. My son is also funnier than I. Amen. And Luke chapter 9, and we're going to see, again, we just saw when Jesus calls them first to this mission, right? And what he tells them is, hey, you need to follow me, and I'm going to make you, meaning I'm going to train you to be a fisherman. They didn't know how to do it. Fast forward 
into his ministry, and we're going to see the next step of Jesus' training. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in Luke chapter 9, and verse 1, it says, When Jesus had called the twelve together, so these are the twelve apostles, amen, mm -hmm. he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. See, his first step was, spend time with me and see what I do. Next step was, I'm going to send you to do what I've done. Yeah. But I'm not going to go with you. And he realized, why? I'm only one man. I can have only so much of an impact. But if I can duplicate myself in these 12 guys, and they do exactly as I do, they're going to go to places that I can't physically go, reach people I can't physically reach. Yeah. And so many more are going to have an opportunity to be with my Father in heaven. <coughs> And see, as disciples of Jesus, if we've taken this calling to follow Him, then we get this purpose of seeking and saving the lost. Remember. And for us, we're doing the same thing. We're imitating Jesus every day, becoming more and more like Him, taking on His purpose so that we can reach people that others can't. Amen? Amen. <coughs> so that we can really evangelize the nations in our generation. Amen? Amen. Our first point here is preach. And heal. Because <clears throat> what Jesus says is like, okay, you spend time with me, but now you need to go out and to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Yes. See, Jesus gives them this power. He gives them the authority. And Jesus has given us his authority yeah. to be able to preach the word, guys. Come on, bro. And to be able to go into people's life yep. and bring spiritual healing, amen? Amen. amen? amen. So that they can be right with God. But not only that, but to be able to meet their physical needs yeah. as well. Mm. See, what we find when Jesus went and he preached, the very <coughs> first thing that he would usually do is meet the physical needs of the people. Yep. Yep. So that they would be in a physical state that they're willing to listen That's to right. a spiritual message that would meet their spiritual needs. Amen? Amen. Yeah. On, See, man. he understood how to reach the people. Yeah. And when we're going out and fishing uh, for men, as Jesus did, did, we need to understand how to reach the people. Amen? Yeah. And a lot of time, understand that people are going through a lot, and we might need to meet some physical needs. Amen? Yeah. So that they can be ready to receive that spiritual help. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's awesome because as a church, not just here in Syracuse, but a, a church worldwide, we, we get to do this, guys. Amen. We get to go after preaching yeah. the kingdom of God, amen, but also after healing the sick, amen. On, now, man. we don't have the physical power to go and, and, and you know, heal no. people of their sicknesses, no. but we do have the power to go and meet some physical needs that they might have. Amen? Amen. Of course, that's what we have, our benevolent arm of mercy worldwide. Amen? Amen. Amen. Which literally, I, I love the fact that we even have the International Day of Mercy. To know that one day out of the year, every church around the world in our movement of churches is working not only on one, but even multiple projects that's right. in yeah. our neighborhoods yes. to meet the needs of those around us that are going through hard times, amen? amen? And there'll be different times. I mean, I remember going to hospitals uh, and, and, uh, and just being able to be with kids that are sick and singing to them and just talking to them and seeing their smiles, uh, to meeting with the elderly, you know, that sometimes they don't even have family that goes yeah. and visits them. Or maybe they're, you know, they just don't have any family that can. And, and just to see them just having such a heart to be like, man, I'm just so grateful that I have someone to talk yeah. to. Yeah, on, to be out, well, to go out and just feed the homeless. And just these projects, for me, I believe that Jesus did this purposefully, amen? amen. And called us to do this because it helps us to see how much we need God. <coughs> and how much people need God. Yeah. And to have a heart, how people in need, you know, they, they want help, and they'll, a lot of people go after doing it and get it. And for us, is that our heart when it comes to meeting spiritual needs as well? Mm -hmm. That we ourselves are willing to do whatever it takes to get it, but we ourselves are willing to do whatever it takes to help someone else yeah. get that spiritual on, help. Amen. Amen. You know, we have our, our day of mercy here coming in two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this morning I, I know that the Max, uh, George said, hey, you know, can you say something? Because literally only a handful of people have signed up. Wow. And I'm like, we've announced this like two weeks ago. You've had this sheet for two weeks, and, and only a handful of people have signed up. I'm like, amen. We all need to repent. Amen. Myself included. I haven't signed up. And so it makes sense that, you know, 
not the rest of you have it. I'm like, oh, I, what, in what way am I leading the way? Mm-hmm. On, and bro. so, again, I don't want anyone that's part of this church to leave without <laughs> signing up for something. Amen? Come, Come, on. On. Come on. There's too much to do. We need all the help we can yeah. get. Amen. You know what's incredible? There's a, a, a young dating couple that came out. And when we first announced it, they were like, can we do the <laughs> breakfast? 6 a.m. They're like, yeah. And when they heard that the breakfast was taken out, they're like, man, that's what I wanted to do. And they were so disappointed that we could, we're not going to do that anymore. And these are people that are just visiting our church. Yeah, right. come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Wow. Yeah. What's our issue? Let's go to Deuteron- uh, Deuteronomy chapter 15. Come on. Yeah. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Preach it, bro. In verse 7. It says, if there is a poor man among you, among your brothers, in any of the towns of the land that the Lord your God has given you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your poor brother. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend him whatever he needs. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts is near, so that you do not show Ill, uh, Ill will toward your needy brother and give him nothing. He may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to him, and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your brothers and toward the poor and needy in your land. Come on. See, and and God is very clear. There will always be the poor and needy amongst us. (laughs) Yep. So as much as we want to, you know, get rid of, you know, uh, poverty, it will always be there. Again, why? Because it helps us see our need for God. Yeah, come on, bro. Come on. And right here, what's the problem? He says, man, you've become hard-hearted. You've become tight-fisted. You're unwilling to even give your money, your time, anything. You're holding on to everything for yourselves. And it's talking about the year of canceling debt. So every seven years, uh, the, the, there'd be uh, an opportunity to whatever you've, you know... Uh, been able to take from someone, you know, and you say, hey, I'm going to pay it back. And if you didn't get to pay it back, then any debt can be canceled. And so that's why it talks about, hey, don't don't be hard-hearted and think, oh, no, the seventh year is coming. I don't want to give him, and then I'm sure he's not going to give it back. So then you withhold from it. But he says, no, give generously, because if not, you're in sin. Wow. And then God will not bless your work. Come on. Yeah. See, literally, God wants to bless you, but because you're holding on to what you have, God doesn't. Bless you, amen. Come on. Again, God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. That's right. And so we serve the same God, and so if we still have the same hard-heartedness towards meeting the needs of those that are needy, God's not going to bless and work in our lives. Come on, bro. So again, everyone, sign up. Come if on, I find out that there's someone here today that didn't sign up, I love you. <laughs> but I'll be calling you. <laughs> Come on, bro. Awesome. And I know where you live. <laughs> That's right. So if you dodge my calls, I'll show up. And I will love you. Come on, bro. I will love you. On to heaven, amen? So, please, let's go after it, amen? And let's amen. repent amen. together. And let's go after healing, amen? amen? And meeting those physical needs. Let's go back to Luke chapter 9. Come on. Now, the other thing that, you know, I just got to bring attention to it, um, you know, uh, on midweek services, we collect benevolence, right? And benevolence is just a, it's a definition, is an act of kindness or, or uh, a charity that is given, right? So it could be a service that you, you know, provide, kind of like the Day of Mercy, right, when we have Mercy events. Or you can give money, amen, and then that money is used to meet the needs. Again, first of the brothers and so for those that don't know, that's what benevolence is for. It's, it's to meet the uh, initial need of the family, amen? Uh, but it can also then be used to meet the needs of the community as well, amen? Mm-hmm. And so one thing that, you know, has been brought to my attention is that benevolence has been extremely low the last few months. Mm-hmm. Come on. Now, again, this is a free will offering, you know? So, but for me, from a very young age, it was like, hey, select a certain amount and be consistent in that. There you go. And a little bit, the Bible says... If you do collect little by little, it'll add up, amen? Yeah. Yeah. And so, honestly, if, for, for us, it's a little amount, but I'm like, if everyone in our church would get just $5, which is nothing, we'd be collecting every week about $100. That's awesome. That's pretty great. 
we have been collecting about fifteen to twenty dollars a week. Yes. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it shows that there's this a hard issue. So I just think we need to do more preaching on this. Amen. 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 Come on, bro. And so I think we are going to be preaching, not just collecting benevolence, but we're going to be preaching about it. Amen. Come on. Because Amen. I want us to all have a conviction to say, hey, I, I'm going to sacrifice to meet the need. For me personally, I've received benevolence, and so I, I know how important it is. Recently. There's a brother going through a lot. We were able to give benevolence. That's great. You know, it helps meet the needs. And no one knows about it, but God does. Amen. 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 Come on. So Luke Amen. chapter 9. So let, let's go after that. Amen. Again, we'll be preaching on that. and helps us to get deeper conviction on that. But in Luke chapter 9, in verse 3, let's continue reading here. It says, he told them, take nothing for the journey. Because, of course, he sent them out to preach and to heal, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No staff. No bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that, their town as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. They went about preaching and healing, fulfilling the command that Jesus gave them. Now, what's interesting is that the direction that he gives them. He says, hey, guys, uh -huh. I want you to go, and I want you to take nothing with you. Uh -huh. Literally, no tunic. Well, no staff. It stops off of, right? So why a staff? Well, this would be as a way to protect themselves from bandits or wild animals. No bag. So you can't carry anything. No extra clothes. No money. Says no bread. Nothing to eat. Uh -huh. No money. You can't buy food. What? You can't you know, even pay for a place to stay. Yeah. And no extra tunic. So this would be for, because at night it would get really cold. So if you didn't sleep indoors mm. with a warm, open flame, mm. you won't be cold. Right. And that's the Syracuse. We know cold, amen? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. What he was saying is like, hey, you need to depend on your evangelism. Wow. For your basic needs. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Food, a place yeah. to stay, close as they want. Come on, bro. And I was like, can you imagine if we had that level of accountability today? <laughs> that way you slept tonight, your meal depended on you finding an open person to take you into their home. I promise you, you'd be sharing with a whole lot more people. <laughs> you'd be like, dude, I need a place to stay. I need some food. I don't want to involuntarily fast. I'm finding somebody. And I'm not stopping until I find somebody. Yeah. It's not like, oh, I talked to that one one person and they, they weren't open. It's okay. Oh, no, you, you would go until you find that one person. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. See, do we have that heart, though? Come on, bro. Of a reliance on our evangelism, amen? Right. See, what was Jesus teaching them? Number one, you need to rely on God for your basic needs. <clears throat> Number two, you need to rely on other people. Hmm. Again, it's not like, God, bring me some food, you know, and we expect this, like, oh, a plate to appear. <laughs> God's like, yeah, I'll give you some food. Go share your faith. Yeah. Someone will pay for your food. So we need to rely on other people. Number three, and I believe most important, you can't rely on self. Because, yeah. mm. see, that's the problem is that we've become so accustomed on relying on ourselves yeah. to meet our own needs that we don't know what it means to rely on God. To truly rely on God. We don't really know what it truly means to rely on other people. Yeah. And it stops us, again, from going out and meeting friends that can hear the gospel and become part of the spiritual families. I mean, these guys, they took Jesus' charge and they went after it. It says that they preached where? Everywhere. Everywhere they went. See, for this summer, we need to imitate. And we need to go where? Everywhere. 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 Everywhere in Syracuse and preach the gospel, amen. You know, we need to be like the, the, the farmer in the parable of the sower, amen. Where did he scatter his seeds? Everywhere. Everywhere. I mean, it makes no sense, you know, if you're really a farmer, like, you, you got to make sure, oh, this soil is good, plant my seed, toil the land, you know, you got to prepare it. But he was like, no, let me just throw it. And hopefully it'll land somewhere where it'll sink in and it'll be good soil and it'll sprout and I'll get some fruits. But he realized he just needs to share wherever, uh, he needs to scatter it wherever it goes. Mm -hmm. Of course, when we study out that parable, we know that God is the farmer. That's yeah. right. The seeds that are spread is the word of God. Yeah. And so again, 
God's all, heart has always been to spread the gospel everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. So our hearts <laughs> should be to spread the gospel everywhere we go, amen. Because we don't know which person will mm. get the word of God, right. have a soft heart to then respond to it, yeah. amen. Yeah. So we just need to scatter the word of God until we meet Come on, that bro. one person, amen. Yeah. Amen. Come on. Let's go down to verse 10. It says, when the apostles returned from preaching and healing, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. So what's cool is that Jesus gave them some direction, and again, some level of accountability. It says, hey, I want you to go out now and preach. Mm -hmm. Do as I've done, but then I need you to come back. And that's what they did. They came back, and they shared what had happened. And it was awesome. We'll find out that God really worked through them. Now, we won't read it for the sake of time, but if this, the rest of, uh, you know, verses 11 to 17, is one of Jesus' most talked about miracles, amen? When he feeds the 5,000, and that's 5,000 men, not including women and children, amen? And, you know, again, I mean, literally, they barely had a few handful of fish and, and bread, and, and literally thousands were able to mm -hmm. eat. And you're like, what an incredible miracle. Mm -hmm. But in the midst of it, I, I believe we missed something. Because we're so focused on like, wow, this, the physical needs of all these people were met. But how did these people get there? Mm -hmm. But what did Jesus just send out the 12 to do? Preach. Preach. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Now, now let that sit in. 5,000 men fed. More women, more children. And who got them there? 12 guys. Wow. wow. 12 guys preaching everywhere they went got thousands of people to come wow. experience a miracle of Jesus. Wow. I ask you, what can 40 disciples come on, bro. of the Syracuse International come on, Christian Church yeah. come on, bro. do? How many thousands of people come on. can we impact if we just but have the heart of disciples mm -hmm. to preach everywhere yeah. we go? Yeah. You know, as I was writing this lesson, I, I could not help but think of our baby uh, sister, Alec, amen? Come on, Alec. So she was baptized about two and a half weeks ago, amen? Oh, yeah. And uh, May 15th. Okay. And, uh, you know, it was awesome. It was a day of rejoicing, amen? She was happy. We were fired up, amen? Mm -hmm. But if you look at the last few weeks, what's been happening? Multiply. <laughs> the multitudes are coming. <laughs> The Amon family is <laughs> Literally, the only one that has in common is, is, is the dad. That's just because he's in Brooklyn, amen. <laughs> but literally, she's had her whole family. Not just family, but even friends are coming out, amen. Why? Because she's just so fired up. She became a disciple, amen. And she's been sharing. So much so that her sister, Atiyang, is studying the Bible, amen. And her younger brother wants to start studying the Bible as well. Amen. You look at him, he's like, why? He's like, 25. No, he's 13, man. You're going to have to be looking at you. 13. Wow. It's amazing what one person with the Word of God in a changed life. Amen. Amen. Come on, bro. See, we all can be like a lack. It just depends. Yeah, How much on, bro. are you preaching? Mm -hmm. How faithful are you, amen? Come on, bro. Yeah. Let's go down to Luke chapter 10. Come on, bro. Luke chapter 10. You know, the rest of Luke chapter 9, a lot of incredible things happen. We're going to fast forward here in verse 1. And it says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others so meaning, after the 12th, these are 72 more, right? And he sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. As the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Oh yeah, that's you guys. Uh. <coughs> go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. <clears throat> if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you. Mm -hmm. For the worker deserves his wages. Mm -hmm. Do not move around from house to house. 
When you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to your feet, we wipe off against you. Yet, be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near you. And so we fast forward a little bit more into Jesus' ministry. So, of course, he took the 12 <coughs> apostles, this guy he, he specifically worked one-on-one -on -one with, and he sent them out to preach. Amen? We saw that in Luke chapter 9. Right here in Luke chapter 10, of course, the multitudes came, so guess what happened? <coughs> people started becoming yeah. disciples of Jesus, amen? <coughs> and so now Jesus is like, man, there's so many people, I need to raise up more leaders. And so he raises up 72 others, amen? Yeah. Yeah. And what's the charge that he gives these guys? The same truck. Yeah. I need you to go out to all the towns yeah, and to preach and to heal. Amen? Come on, Bob. See, it's all about being on a mission for God. Amen? Amen. You know, what's incredible is that he says the same thing. If you go to a town and they welcome you, what do you got to preach? The kingdom is near. Come on, bro. If you go to a town... And they don't welcome you. What do you got to preach? The kingdom is there. See? The message did not change based on the response of the people. Come on. See, we cannot change the message because people start, you know, squirming around. But I don't see that I need to repent and be baptized. Well, that's what the Bible says. That's right, bro. And you need to pray for God to open your eyes and see it. Yes. More than that, open your heart. Yes. And see it. Come on. Deal with whatever you need to deal with. Yeah. But that's the way to be saved. That's a way to get our sins forgiven. Acts chapter 238, amen? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's very simple. Yeah. But we can't preach it just to a piece to the people. Right. we got to make sure that we're preaching boldly so that we can really bring spiritual healing <coughs> in the lives of men and women on, in the city of Syracuse. Amen. Amen. So this summer, let's be disciples. Our focus Amen. on preaching Amen. and healing. Amen. 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 Amen Luke chapter 10. Let's go down to verse 17. The Bible reads, The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. We'll stop right there. Now, I kind of did share this, but I think this is kind of cool. Because, you know, it, it's kind of interesting that it's 72. And, and if you know me, I'm all about the numbers. Amen, Amen. bro. Come on. <laughs> now, if you know any math, two numbers, if you multiply them, make 72. Amen? That's 12 and 6. All right? And so, again, if you get the apostles, 12 apostles, and you pair them up two by two. Because remember, he sent out these 72 two by two, right? Yeah. So you pair them up, you get... Six groups of two, right? Six. If you get that group getting 12 disciples of their own, you get, again, 72. And so it's cool to see how now, not only was Jesus had his 12, but his 12 had 12 as well. Right, come on. And you see this multiplying ministry, amen, which we'll get to see in the book of Acts, amen? How that's what it was all about. It's about, hey, multiplying your ministry, raising up so that they too can be in a way have a similar role as the apostles, amen? Yeah. And so they go, they preach, and then they, again, like the 12, what happens after they preach? They return with joy. They come back. The right. level of accountability, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, well, you know, they're fired up, and we'll see why. We'll say, demons literally bow down. They're like, we saw some incredible stuff, Jesus. He's like, okay, that's awesome. I saw, verse 18, Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Yep. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. <laughs> However, do not rejoice that your spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. <coughs> and see, they were excited like, Jesus, we're having an impact. People are literally, I mean, demons are being driven out and they're coming into droves. He's like, that's incredible, but do not rejoice in that. Rejoice in the fact that you will make it to heaven. And that's our second point. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Amen. See, this summer, I want us to see a lot of victories. Amen. I want to see the multitudes come and visit our church. 
study the Bible, become disciples, yeah. repent, be baptized, be able to receive salvation. And that's going to be a joyous occasion. But we can't find our ultimate joy in those miracles. Mm -hmm. Because our joy needs to come in our personal relationship with God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the fact that when we die, if we but remain faithful, our names will be written in heaven. Amen. 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 Why this warning from Jesus? Well, because if we base our joy based on the victories, then how are we going to feel when there are no victories? Yeah, come on. See, when there are no baptisms, yeah. when there are no miracles in your life, will you still rejoice? Mm -hmm. Because in the end, your name is written in the book of life. Right. Amen. You know, let's go to Habakkuk chapter 3. Come on. Come on. If you don't know what that book is, ask your neighbor. <laughs> but it's, it's towards the end of the Old Testament, right before Stephaniah. So it's kind of, I think it's the fourth book before the end. There we go, before Malachi. But Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. The Bible reads, Though the fig trees, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields <coughs> produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Yeah. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. Come on, bro. I mean, the heart of Habakkuk is incredible. He says, though everything <coughs> fails, though I make no money, pretty much. Come on. I got no food. Yeah. Yet I will rejoice because of my God. I mean, you could tell that this man had an incredible relationship yep. with God. And he just rejoiced in the fact that his name was written in heaven. Come on. Now, verse 19 is kind of interesting. That might seem similar. I, I, I feel like I've read that before, but not here. Come on, bro. Well, if you turn to Psalm 18, that actually comes, and he is quoting uh, a psalm here that David wrote. In Psalm 18, we're going to pick it up in verse 35. The Bible reads, I'm sorry, uh, verse 30 to 35. Come on, bro. As for God... His way is perfect, amen. Mm -hmm. The word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield for all who take refuge in, in him. For who is God beside the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength. He makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You give me your shield of victory, and your right hand sustains me. You stoop down to make <laughs> me great. Mm -hmm. And we find this prayer by David. And he realized God is the one that gives me the strength. He is the one that gives me victories. I am nothing without my God. And if you read the whole of Psalm 18, I mean, it's incredible. He's not going through the best of times right here. He's actually going through a hard time. And so Habakkuk, going through hard times, is reminded of this passage right here. And so for me, it's kind of funny. I actually... Uh, the first time I was introduced to this scripture was when I, I first became a disciple. Come on. And, uh, you know, we, we, uh, for Thanksgiving, we would play a turkey ball, so, you know, a football game. Mm -hmm. uh, usually we do it, like, Friday or something like that, or sometimes thurs uh, Thursday morning, very early. And, uh, you know, I was an athlete, amen, and, and I played a lot of different sports. But I was still kind of new, so people didn't you know, know much about me. They just knew I was an athlete because that's all the clothes that I would wear, amen, um, <laughs> when I first came into the kingdom. And, you know, and for me, I, I would never be, be one to boast and be like this. And then, oh, can you play? I'm like, well, football's not my sport, but I can run fast and I can catch. It sh should be awesome. I'll, I'll love to play. And, and I kicked butt that day, guys. <laughs> Come on, bro. And his brother's like, bro, we're trying to catch you. You're like a deer. And, like, just going around and we couldn't even get you. And I was like, what? And so he shared the scripture with me. <laughs> and, uh, and for me, like, I, I've always just uh, envisioned that and I've reminded the scripture. But what's cool is that. We find Habakkuk is willing to remind the scriptures, to remind himself of the scriptures during this hard time. Yeah. <clears throat> and for me, I thought about, like, wow, what scriptures do I have in my arsenal? Mm -hmm. 
Mm. When I'm going through hard times. Mm. See, what scriptures do you have Amen. in your arsenal when Satan is coming after you? Yeah. When there's no victories and when Help. Satan is trying to steal your joy. Yeah. So that you can be reminded of your relationship with God and rejoice that your name is written in the book of life. Mm. See, for me, Psalm 18 is one of them. Yeah. On, Psalm 23 is another one. When I'm feeling anxious, First yeah. Peter 5. I believe it's verse 3. And then, of course, we just study out the book of Philippians. Philippians 4. There you go. See, I have, my, I have my scriptures to go when I'm not feeling awesome and I don't want to rejoice so that I can change my heart yeah. and then my actions can follow. And I believe that's what the Israelites did. They just memorized scriptures. They memorized hymns so that they could fight during hard times to rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Let's go back to Luke chapter 10. Come on. Now, I believe the other thing that's going to help us to fight is... The fellowship, amen. Our brothers and sisters can help us to get us out of the funk and be able to rejoice, amen. Absolutely, bro. Come on. And Luke chapter 10, verse 23, and we'll talk more about that, says, Then he turned to his disciples and said, Privately, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that, not may, that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Amen. And of course, he's talking about the kingdom of God. Yeah. Right. And he's telling them, guys, you realize you're getting to experience the kingdom. Amen. Wow. Something that prophets in the Old Testament wanted to see. Preach about it, prophesy, but they didn't get to live it out. Yeah. And you're getting to experience it. Yeah. And then you're getting to preach the word and help people to experience it as well. Wow. And he's just helping them to see, are you grateful for the kingdom? Amen. See, this morning, we have seen the kingdom, many of us. We have experienced it. We are part of it. Are you still grateful for it? Come on, bro. Come on. How valuable is the kingdom to you, amen? Come on, bro. How valuable are the relationships in the kingdom? Mm -hmm. These are the relationships that will keep us faithful to God and will yeah. keep us rejoicing, amen? Come on, bro. I know for me, it was said to me, you need seven incredible yeah. relationships to remain faithful. Come on. Right. Mm. Yeah, seven is number of completion, amen? It's well, not a spiritual yeah. number. Yeah. But yeah. it's true. Good number. Because if you have one, what happens if they fall away? Oh, yeah. Right. That's right. You have two, what happens if they fall away? Yeah. Then, then, then what? Amen, we have our relationship with God, but again, we need other people to help us stay connected. Yeah. I love the relationship of David and Jonathan. And what David was going through a lot, it says, Jonathan helped David find strength in God. Yep. Amen. Amen. See, not find strength in the relationship, but the relationship was able to guide him to God, who can yep. give him what? The strength that he needs. Amen. And so that's why we need one another. So that we're down, we know that we're going through it, and then we can help one another find strength in God. Amen. And so I want us to go after remembering, hey, God's going to perform miracles. But let's rejoice that our names are written hey, in the man. book of life. Amen. 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 And let's go up to Acts chapter 2. Come on, bro. And finish up there. Come on. You know, in Acts chapter 28, uh, we, you don't have to turn there. In verse 30 to 31, you can write it down. You know, when you're grateful about something, when you're passionate about something, you know what you got to do? You got to tell everyone about it. You know, when I met my wife, we were dating. Like I said, I, I played sports. I played specifically at that time volleyball. I played in summer. My summer mission was to be at Central Park, New York City, from uh, roughly 8 a.m. to about 8 p.m. <laughs> Monday through Sunday. Wow. 12 hours. Doing what? Volleyball. When uh, I first met my wife, that's how we met. It was through volleyball. She came to uh, you know, play during the summer. It was awesome. And then uh, when we talked, we talked about many things. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about one thing. Guess what? Volleyball. volleyball. <laughs> when I talked to my friends, that's what I talked to them about. Volleyball. volleyball. Yeah. I evangelized volleyball, guys. <laughs> I had my own disciple in volleyball. Where I literally that summer, like, hey, we're training and we're going to go on doubles tournaments. And I literally, he didn't know how to play volleyball. And guess what? I taught him how to play volleyball. Made the college team. Mm. I coached club uh, volleyball. Got to go to California because of it. It was awesome. All expenses paid. It was great. But it was awesome because I was so passionate about it. Yeah. My life revolved around it. So much so that at our wedding, friends from high school, guess what they gave us? Volleyball. volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> Still have <laughs> 
Okay. People knew. I know, I know. It's, it's not a healthy relationship I have with volleyball. I have. I've since repented and I remember. It's awesome. Amen. I'm not debaucherous of volleyball. Do not follow my example. But I share all that to say when we're passionate about something, we're going to talk about it. I don't care if you don't want to hear about it. I'm going to tell you about it. Yep. Are we that passionate about the kingdom of God? Come on. Come on. See, Paul in Acts chapter 30, uh, 28, verse 31 says that he. Even though he was incarcerated in Rome, he preached about Jesus and the kingdom of God. Mm. See, they go hand in hand. See, is that what we preach? Or do we just preach Jesus and forget to preach about the family of God, Come the on. kingdom of God, amen? Come on. Because Christianity was never a one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's always been a community yeah, connected with God. And we need to help each other remain faithful to God through the community of God, the kingdom of God. Amen? amen. And right here, we in Acts chapter 2, of course, we find when the kingdom comes. Amen? Mm -hmm. It's established here on earth. And then we see an incredible blueprint of what our church should look like in verse 42 of Acts chapter 2. It says, the disciples, and right before this, it says 3,000 were baptized and added to the disciples' number. Again, the multitudes come. When the gospel is preached, amen? amen. It says, they devoted themselves. So who's they? This is the apostles. Uh, probably the 72. Yeah. Roughly there are about 120 that were, uh, remained faithful to Jesus. And then now the 3,000. So this is the conviction of the 3,000 baby Christians and the 120 that were left after Jesus died, resurrected, and was taken up to heaven. It says, they devoted <laughs> themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. They gave to anyone as he had need. So remember, you got to preach, you got to heal, meet the needs. Mm -hmm. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They bought bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, rejoicing, and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Yeah. And we see this daily addition that was happening, amen? Because this group of men just decided to start, and women decided to preach the gospel. Come on. And to say, we're going to preach everywhere, starting in Jerusalem, amen? amen. Yeah. And we see this incredible devotion to the kingdom of God, to the family, being willing to meet all the needs, meeting... How often? Every day. day. Yep. Talk about a devotion to spending time together, amen? Mm -hmm. But it starts off, and this is our third and final point, daily devotion. Come on, bro. Since they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, right? To the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And so a lot of times when we teach this, we're like, hey, these are the four things we need to be devoted to, right? Mm -hmm. But it's kind of interesting. If you actually look at the grammar... It reads like this, to the apostles' teaching <coughs> and to the fellowship, comma, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. See, if it was four things, it'd probably be more to the apostles' teaching, comma, to the fellowship, comma, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And so what we find that it's really not four things, but it's really two things, two <laughs> groups. If you read the Darley Bible, they actually break it down pretty well. It says... And they persevered in the teaching and fellowship of the apostles. Hmm. And breaking of bread and prayers. And so we get this sense that there was this fellowship of the apostles. That literally is like, guys, you need to be devoted just like the, the apostles' fellowship was. And when you think about their fellowship, what did they do? They preached the word everywhere they went together. They had meals together. <coughs> Literally, they did everything together. And it was this teaching of, hey, as a community, we need to come together and have this level of fellowship. Yeah. And we, yes, we're a church, but even within our church, we need those smaller family groups that are help us <coughs> remain devoted to our God. Amen? Amen. You know... I believe that each disciple needs to be a part of this group. And so, of course, that's why our church does Bible talks, amen? amen. amen. It's this group of which we can say even like a peer group, amen? amen. 
We're literally, we're just one small family within the larger family, right, amen, that's working together. And what's cool is when you have this level of love, level of devotion towards God and one another, guess what it's going to do to those around you? It's going to bring them. It's going to bring them. They're going to be attracted to it. Yeah. Is I want to be a part of this family, amen. I know for me, that's what pulled me into the kingdom. Yeah, well, come on, yes, I know. It was my, my, my girlfriend breaking up with me and all that. But <laughs> what helped me to stay here? That's like the, the, the spark, amen. Oh, What's the family? Yeah, come on. And being bro. Latino, family is everything. Yeah. yeah, come on. And so for me, I had a conviction about you fight for family and, and you look for family. <coughs> and so for me, I, when I saw this family, I was like, wow, this is a family I desire to be a part of. See, Come on, bro. we need to build up our Bible talks, our family, amen, and be able to be daily devoted <coughs> to one another. See, when should we be sharing our faith? The day of Bible talk? No. no. All the time. Yeah. All the time. Daily devotion. But again, there's wisdom. Jesus sent them out one by one. Two by two. Two by two. See? That's what we need to improve on, man. Yeah, yeah. come on. It's, it's this level of independence that is nowhere in the Bible. Mm. Yeah. And put it to death. Yeah. And say, we're a family, and we're going and doing things as a family, amen? Yeah. And developing that fellowship that the apostles had, amen? <coughs> Why does it say persevere? Because it's hard, amen? But when you persevere, you don't quit. God will bless it, amen? That's right, amen. Bro. You know, for the campus, uh, this is what we're doing. And, you know, Friday night we had a great time together after tagging. And I'm like, guys, we're going and starting a summer campaign, amen? So that we can go after this summer mission that Jesus is calling us to go after, amen? Yeah, come on. And so I'll be talking about it more with the Bible Talk leaders at our leaders meeting and sharing uh, the, the campaign that we're sharing. And I want you to do the same, something similar. Of course, it's not going to be to the level of the campus students, which have more time, Amen. But I want you to incorporate something like it, amen, so that we can develop this fellowship, amen, of our, with our brothers and sisters, and really be able to see that, hey, daily devotion leads to what? Daily additions, amen? amen. And I believe if we go after this, we can see an incredible summer harvest, amen? So for the disciples, the challenge today is to be part of a summer mission with your Bible talk, amen? amen. Come on, bro. Make it your ambition and your vision to save one soul. Of course, to do that, you got to share everywhere. Yeah, come yeah, on, bro. And for those that are missing us, study the Bible, as Bob said. <coughs> and join us in this campaign come on. to be able to live the greatest life that you can live and really fulfill the greatest purpose you can fulfill. Come on, bro. To literally change the eternal Amen. destination of a man or a woman. And I believe if we go after this, truly, we will be fulfilling a summer mission that Jesus has called us to. Thank you, and to God be all the glory.